This is GM Word of the Week, and I'm Fiddleback. Rune. We here at the Word of the Week, being fans of all manner of fantasy games and movies and literature, are no stranger to runes. When we see mysterious angular writing inscribed on the hilt of a sword or the surface of an amulet or tattooed onto the body of a mysterious shirtless stranger brandishing a staff, we know what it means as clearly as we know what's in a bottle marked with a skull and crossbones. It means magic is contained within. Or in the case of the mysterious tattooed wizard, magic is about to happen to us. Probably painfully. Because in the fantasy genre, runes are basically just a warning label. Warning, this product contains magic. Do not use if you are pregnant or may become pregnant. Inform your doctor if an enchantment lasts for more than four hours. And so on. Now, we're not going to deny the utility of warning labels. I'm sure most adventurers wish the fantasy worlds that are constantly trying to kill them had a few more warning labels included. It'd be nice, for example, if the strange carving above that treasure chest had a sign saying, Warning! Fiery exhaust! Keep back! And while it might be silly if every crossbow had a warning label that said, Point this end only at green-skinned persons, a label on a sword that read cursed, Do not equip, would definitely be handy. And, of course, it would be wonderful if every snake, giant insect, needle trap, and random bottle carried the skull and crossbones we mentioned above. If imbibed, contact local cleric, inform your healer if you have a disadvantage on constitution saving throws, and so on. Come to think of it, have you ever wondered about that skull and crossbones thing? Sure, it means poison today, but at various times in history it has meant warning may contain dead people, or beware of pirates, or we are the bad guys, or you are about to watch a bad fictional dramatization about an Ivy League college secret society starring Joshua Jackson and that guy from Coach. The skull and crossbone symbol actually dates back to ancient Egypt, believe it or not. But it didn't begin with Egyptian alchemy, as you might expect. In fact, the skull and crossbones wasn't used to signify poison until the mid-1850s in the United States. And it was one of several competing symbols used throughout the world for poison. In 1986, though, a study at the University of Alberta concluded that it was one of the most effective and recognizable symbols across the entire world to symbolize both poison and lethal hazards. Especially when it was contained within a triangle. Seriously. They determined that the most effective skull and crossbones was a white one inside a black triangle. But getting back to ancient Egypt, the ancient Egyptians had their own skull and crossbones symbol. Well, not actually crossbones, crossed tools. And not actually a skull, but a face. If you pay attention to the depictions on Egyptian sarcophagi of the the, the, you know, the contents of the sarcophagi, you might notice that many of them depict the inhabitant holding a crossed flail and shepherd's crook directly under their face. It is most famously seen on idols of King Tutankhamun. The flail is thought to represent judgment, while the crook represents mercy, as the flail was used to beat animals, while the crook was used to lead and pull animals without causing them harm. The skull above crossed bones became a symbol of death during the waning days of the Roman Empire and into the Middle Ages. The symbol was used to mark Christian tombs and catacombs, in Italy and in Spain. And the symbol became associated with death as a result, but it also became associated with Christianity. And that's when it got into the hands of the Knights Templar, and onto the flags. Now, the Knights Templar or rather the poor fellow soldiers of Christ in the Temple of Solomon. The Templars are a very famous and vastly misunderstood organization that have ended up at the center of all sorts of conspiracy stories and mythologies and video games about kindly assassins fighting evil knights and movies with Nicolas Cage. And we can't go into all of that now. Suffice it to say that originally... They were merely a charitable military organization who originally protected pilgrims traveling from Europe to Jerusalem after the First Crusade. Despite their impoverished beginnings, though, they quickly grew wealthy and powerful and were instrumental in later Crusades. 
None of that is important, though. What is important is that their occasional use of the skull and crossbones symbol may have influenced its association with piracy. There are two legends connecting the Knights Templar to the skull and crossbones symbol. The first is that they depict the corpse of Jacques de Molay. He was the last Grand Master of the Templars, and one of the most famous. See, by the start of the 14th century, the Templars were wealthy, but their influence was in decline. Support for the Crusades had dwindled, and the organization was crumbling. Meanwhile, King Philip IV of France had borrowed a lot of money from the Templars, and France was deeply in debt. So, King Philip figured he could wipe some of his debts clean by disbanding the Templars, and he could repay other debts by seizing their assets. He did so on some possibly trumped-up heresy charges. And after he burned de Molay, he left his remains for the remaining Templars to find with the skull sitting atop his crossed femurs. Another legend tells that it is something called the Skull of Sidon. The story goes like this. The lord of the city of Sidon in modern-day Lebanon was a knight of the temple. When his young lover died, he was so distraught that after the burial, he dug up her body. He was hoping to find her alive, apparently. But she wasn't. And he fell into despair. But voices and dreams directed him to wait nine months and then return to the grave to find his son. Nine months later, the Lord followed this completely sane and reasonable impulse and found a small child's skull resting on the crossed femurs of his lover's skeleton. Voices told him to guard the skull, for it would bless him and protect him. And thus, it became a symbol of the order. The Knights Templar most famously used the skull and crossbones symbol to mark their ships. And after the fall of the order, many survivors fled to Malta and lived as marines and sailors. And it is interesting to note that, in the late Middle Ages, as piracy grew, both Malta and Sedan were havens for piracy. And thus, the tradition of marking ships with a skull and crossbones spread to piracy. But we digress. After all, we started talking about runes, and how runes are used as warning labels to mark possibly magical things. And this is usually the part where we debunk the whole idea and say, actually, though, the word rune and the specific collection of symbols normally called runes are just the letters of some ancient alphabet that has nothing to do with magic. But this time, we're not going to do that. Because although what we think of as runes really were just the letters of an ancient alphabet, they were also totally magical. Supposedly. Mythologically. At the very least, if you found a golden amulet or a sword marked with runes, you really were dealing with something someone thought was magical. First of all, when we think of a rune, we think of a small symbol inscribed on an object. We usually picture particularly angular linear symbols. And that's because the word rune comes from an old Germanic word which was itself derived from an older Norse word, runestaf. And that word just means letter. Well, actually, the staf part means letter or symbol. The rune part means secret or mystery. So the word literally means mystic symbol. But figuratively, it actually just means letter of the alphabet, or rather, letter of the futhark. But we'll come back to that. What you have to understand is that runes are just Norse and Germanic letters. They were used to write stuff down, and because they were inscribed into wood or bone or stone or metal, they were simple, angular things. Things you could draw with a few linear strokes. Linguistically, they are a combination of old Germanic pagan symbols smashed together with the Proto-Roman alphabet, and they appeared between 50 CE and 150 CE. And that's it. They were just a writing system. Germanic warrior tribes picked them up in southern Europe, combined them with their own pagan symbols, 
and carried them into Northern Europe where they influenced the Norse cultures. Simple as that. So, what's with the whole mystery symbol thing? Well, that ties into Norse mythology. See, the ancient Norse and Germanic peoples didn't think they'd invented their writing system at all. They believed that the runes represented mystical symbols used to record the ebb and flow of fate. And they were the purview of three entities known as the Norns. The Norns were three wise, powerful beings who lived at the bottom of the great tree Yggdrasil which contains the whole cosmos. The Norns carved symbols into the roots of the tree, which recorded and allowed them to influence the destiny of the nine worlds of the Norse cosmos. Odin, the king of the Norse gods, was jealous of the Norns for their wisdom and their influence. Now, supposedly, only those truly worthy could even see the runes and Odin had to figure out how to prove his worth. So he decided to, in his own words, as recorded in the Navamal, the old Norse poem that talks about this whole thing, he decided to sacrifice himself to himself. He hung himself from Yggdrasil, as in hung by the neck, and he stabbed himself with a spear, and he forbade the other gods from helping him, or even giving him a drink of water. And he hung there, staring down at the Norns and the runes. And gradually, he was able to see and understand them. Through his sacrifice, he had gained knowledge. Presumably, there followed a comical misunderstanding wherein Odin kept telling his friends that he was really done, and they said, You told us not to help you no matter what you said. And he said, I meant not to help until I was done. And they said, You said no matter what and so on. But eventually, he was cut down, and the runes gave him the power to heal wounds, like self-inflicted spear wounds, presumably, and call the dead, to bind his enemies, to call fire, to send fire away, and so on. Now, this could be interpreted as him espousing the power of the written word to record knowledge. Or it could just be translated as him gaining godly power. But whatever was meant, what humanity ended up with, was 24 letters called the Futhark. The Futhark is basically just an alphabet. It's got 24 symbols, and each one represents a consonant or vowel sound. In fact, it's even named the same way. See, the reason we call the alphabet by that name is because the first two letters of the Greek alphabet, on which the Roman alphabet was based, were Alpha and Beta. Futhark is just a smashing together of the sounds of the first six letters of the collection. F, U, Th, A, R, K. Futhark. And at this point, for all you old English types who like to pepper their games with ye oldy butchered English, we have some news for thee. Thou art doing it wrong. And it's all down to a particular letter called Thorn. See, the Futhark runes spread throughout Northern Europe, and it became THE system of writing to use if you were Norse, or Germanic, or Anglo-Saxon. But it did gradually evolve. For one example, the Anglo-Saxon runic alphabet is called the Futhork, because the A sound gradually evolved into an O sound. For another, in England and Northern Europe, it kind of smashed headlong into the Roman alphabet, and some very interesting things happened. For example, the third letter is called thorn, and it makes a th sound. Now, in Latin and the Romance languages, the th sound isn't particularly common. The Greeks had a special letter for it, theta, but the Romans didn't bother. In places with Germanic linguistic roots, they just kept using the letter thorn for the th sound. Of course, gradually, the thorn started to mutate a little, all letters do and it was starting to look a little more like another letter. Which was good, because in the 15th century, when the printing press became a thing, there was no letter thorn. They were using the Roman alphabet, but they did have a letter that looked very similar. The letter Y. 
What's our point? Our point is that, thanks to the smashing of Roman and Germanic letters together, the Y and the Thorn have developed mixed identities. The upshot of which is that the word that you think is pronounced ye is actually the word the, as in the olde butcher shape. So if you refer to anything as ye old, you're wrong. This has also led to a lot of confusion about the second person old timey pronouns thee and thou and thy. Some linguists have speculated that because of the th and y confusion, the word thou might actually just be the word you, and is based on the Latin word tu, which means you. Confounding the whole issue is the fact that in some works, you and thou were used together and not interchangeably. In fact, it seems as if there may have been some honorific difference between you and thou and thee. And while we're on the subject, let's talk briefly about the article the. T-H-E. Have you ever noticed that there are two pronunciations, the and the? And have you ever noticed that most people, probably even you, switch back and forth between the two pronunciations? Well, guess what? There is actually a rule. You say the before a consonant, or the before a vowel. As in, after dinner at the Outback Steakhouse, we stopped for a drink at the coffee shop. You also use the before a consonant or a vowel when you want to emphasize a word. As in, at the coffee shop, we ran into Nicolas Cage. Yes, the Nicolas Cage. While most people have never thought twice about it, most, but not all, people in the United States usually unconsciously obey this rule. Try it yourself and see how wrong it feels to do it the opposite way. And, speaking of the thorn, you have actually seen the thorn. You probably see it every day. Well, you've seen a mutant hybrid thorn smashed into another rune. The ubiquitous symbol for Bluetooth you see every time you pair your iPhone with a set of headphones because Apple has decided we don't deserve headphone jacks anymore. The symbol for Bluetooth is actually a combination of two Futhark runes. The Burkana, which makes a B sound, and the Thorn. And those are the first and last letters of Bluetooth, spelled out in runes. And, of course... The technology for short-range wireless communication is called Bluetooth because it's named after a famous Viking king of Denmark who ruled between 958 CE and 970 CE. Seriously. What happened was this. There was a coalition of engineers in the mid-1990s who realized that wireless communication between consumer devices was becoming a big thing. And it was also becoming something like the Wild West. Every company developing devices that could communicate wirelessly with other devices had their own standards and protocols and systems. And that meant that devices made by one manufacturer couldn't communicate with devices made by another manufacturer. So this coalition of engineers got together to develop a universal standard for wireless communication. And one of those people was an Intel engineer named Jim Kardak and he had just finished reading a book about Vikings. And in the book, he learned about a famous Danish king who united Denmark and conquered Norway, Harald Bluetooth. Or to give him his proper name, Harald Bluetooth Gormson. In the early 900s, Denmark was a bit of a mess. It was a mix of German settlements, Viking settlements, and Christian enclaves. Gorm the Old, then King, was a fiercely devoted follower of the Norse traditions, and he set about unifying Denmark under his rule by force. And one of his fiercest acts was to destroy a number of Christian churches and towns on the border between Denmark and the German lands. This brought him into direct conflict with a German king named Henry the Fowler. And Fowler defeated Gorm so thoroughly that Gorm was forced to rebuild all of the churches he'd destroyed and grant tolerance for Christianity throughout his land. Gorm did so. 
and soon thereafter he died of natural causes, and his kingdom was left to his son Harald. Harald set out to continue his father's goal of uniting Denmark under unified rule, but unlike his father, he'd seen the benefit of tolerating Christianity and gaining an alliance with the Holy Roman Empire that held sway in Central Europe. While Harald himself did not convert to Christianity, he developed a working relationship with an order of Benedictine monks in his capital, Jutland. He was also a skilled military leader. He strengthened the fortifications in Denmark and built a number of Trelleborg ring forts. Those are the iconic wooden Viking forts you can picture in your head. After securing his borders, he helped his nephews, the Grey Cloaks, reclaim their lands in Norway following the death of their father, King Eric Bloodaxe. Unfortunately, while the unification of Denmark stuck, Harald's reign did not, and what happened is not entirely clear due to sparse records and conflicting accounts. Somehow, conflict broke out between Harald Bluetooth and Otto the Great, the Holy Roman Emperor. Control over Denmark shifted back and forth during the ensuing war. And eventually, history records that Harold Bluetooth died in battle. As for the name Bluetooth, that comes from the fact that Harold had a supposedly discolored and prominent front tooth. As to why Jim Kardak thought that would be a perfect name for a standard form of short-range wireless radio communication, well, he explained it himself. In an interview, Kardak said, He was famous for uniting Scandinavia, just as we intend to unite the PC and cellular industries with a short-range wireless link. But we did promise that we wouldn't completely debunk the connection between runes and magic. And we weren't speaking of the magic of wireless communication between your game console of choice and its controller. We really meant that. See, the whole idea of the Futhark runes being magical? That wasn't just mythology. Well, it was insofar as magic is mythology, but there were actually instructions for marking your favorite trinkets with magic runes. And most of them were described in an epic poem known as the Sigurd Dreyfumal. That epic, whose name we don't need to keep saying, is actually a set of instructions passed down from the Valkyrie Brynhildr. That epic actually describes a number of different forms of magic runes. Among them are victory runes, which are inscribed on the hilts of swords or on other weapons, wave runes, which are carved into the hulls of ships to protect them, and many others. Such runes provided various blessings and protections. In addition, it became common practice in the 5th and 6th century in Scandinavia to inscribe runes into bracteates. A bracteate is a thin golden medallion worn as jewelry. They were common in Rome and Central Europe. But in Scandinavia, they could be inscribed with various runic words. For example, the word elu, which means ale, might be inscribed onto a medallion. It seems that such ale runes might have protected against magical charms and curses. And while scholars can only speculate at why the word ale might have that association, it might have something to do with the association of ale with a trance-like or madness state. Other runes included a lokar, or garlic rune, which provided protection against evil, because garlic was often used as a medicine or antidote. And then there was the lethu, or invitation rune, that could be used for calling on supernatural forces. In the end, there's a lot of precedent for magical runes empowering magical objects and, thereby, serving as convenient labels for mystical artifacts. But runes were really just another alphabet, and every language had its written magical practices. However you use them in your games, though, just remember, it's not ye oldie, it's the old. If you take anything away from this episode, please take that. In fact, maybe just stay away from old-timey English altogether, okay? This has been GM Word of the Week. It's written and researched by the Angry GM and produced by me, Fiddleback. You can support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash gmwordoftheweek. You can find more at gmwordoftheweek.com and theangrygm.com.